Our Father and our God, we thank you for the grace you have revealed, amazing grace indeed, that you could see us in our conditions of sin and degradation, helplessness and hopelessness, and call us out of our darkness and bring us to your own side. We know it is all by grace. We're grateful that you have called us. We're grateful that your hand is upon us. Father, we pray that what you have started, you'll complete and you'll continue until you finish in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we pray that whatever needs to still be done in our lives, by your own grace, in your own power, in your own love and compassion, you will reach out to us and accomplish it in Jesus' name. Amen. We thank you for what we're studying in the Acts of the Apostles. We thank you for the lives we're seeing changed. And we know you can still do the same today. And we're praying that as we read and study, the same things we've done for these people, you'll do for us and through us in Jesus' name. Amen. Be with us in our study here today again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For some time now we have been following Paul the Apostle through the journey, the missionary journey that he went through. And just last week we started on the follow-up and evangelism that he carried through with other people in the power of God. Today again we continue our study and I'm believing that as Paul the Apostle and other people in the Acts of the Apostles allowed God to work mightily through him, that we too will allow God to work mightily through us in Jesus' name. That as we are studying these passages, our lives will be transformed by his own power. Today we're looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16, verses 9 to 18. In the passage we'll discover two women in particular, and we'll see how the Lord worked mightily. One of the women transfigured, the other one disfigured. One touched by the hand of God, converted, saved, and beginning to serve the Lord. The other, we see what the devil did in her life. And then we also see marvelous grace, infinite grace, reaching out to her to even deliver her from satanic oppression. We're reading from Acts chapter 16, from verse 9. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samothracia, and the next day to Neapolis, and from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia, and a colony. And we were in that city, abiding certain days, and on the Sabbath day we went out of the city by, by riverside, where prayer was wont to be made. And we sat now and spake unto the women which resorted thither. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple, of the city of Tatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were sp sp spoken of Paul. <coughs> and when she was baptized, and her household, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel, possessed with a spirit of divination, met us, which brought her masters much gain by suit, saying, The same followed Paul and us, and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this, this she, many days, 
But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee, in the name of Jesus Christ, to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. In all these things that we're reading, we are taking lessons and instructions for our own lives and ministry. That as the Lord will be leading us and using us, we'll see how people who have gone before us have yielded to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And in the same way, we'll be yielding and we'll be successful as they were successful in Jesus' name. As Paul's evangelistic team entered into Europe, in answer to the Macedonian call, notable miracles took place in saving people and delivering people. In particular, we have focus on women. Now we need to understand that God's love has always reached out to women to save, to heal, to deliver, to bless, to give security and hope. And in our passage today, we can see that God is still mindful of the tears and sorrows of women, of the needs, spiritual and physical, of women as well as of men. In our passage, we'll see direct leading, secured, devout Lydia saved, and demonized lady set free. If you come back to Acts chapter 16 from verse 6, you'll see that the Holy Spirit had been directing and leading, controlling and restraining the apostle and the team, guiding them and showing them where to go, what to do. And we must say that their success depended very much on their yieldedness to the control of the Holy Spirit in our lives too. You'll find that in every area of our lives, our success, our achievement will depend on how we're able to yield and submit to the control and to the prompting, to the restriction, or to the leading of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 16 verse 6, now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, after they had come to Mysia, they assayed or they endeavored to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. That is, the Spirit of God permitted them not. Our success depends on how we react, respond to the touch, to the influence, and to the control of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has spoken originally, said, Pray unto me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work that I have for them. And they went out. In every way, they responded to the power, to the influence of the Holy Spirit, and they were successful. They came back, and in this follow-up trip again, they still depended upon the Holy Spirit. And after they had visited the churches, that is Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke, now, as I mentioned Luke, you might wonder why we mention Luke. Because we have not heard the mention of the name of Luke since um, we'll be reading. But in this passage today, it will begin to see the word we and us. And you recognize it's Luke that wrote the Acts of the Apostles. He wrote the Gospel according to St. Luke. And from the first three verses of Acts of the Apostles in chapter 1, we also discover he wrote Acts of the Apostles. And now as the writer, he began to say we and us in the passage of today. That's what makes us to know that he joined the team in this passage. And so the team, Paul, Silas, Timothy, and um, Luke, and perhaps others, they began to respond to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit restricted them or restrained them, cautioning them not to go into Asia as at that time they yielded. They were not stubborn. They were not rebellious. And then they wanted to go into Bithynia. And the Spirit of God again restricted them and said, no. We must always learn how to say no to the devil and how to say yes to the Lord. In your life, in very many areas, in your marriage, in your business, in your Christian endeavor, in your ministration, in the things that you do, you must be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit because 
That is what gives us the success and the achievement. In verse 8, and they passing by, Messiah came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him and pleaded with him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. Now at this time, while the Spirit of God was restricting or restraining Paul and the team, he kept open to the Lord. He kept yielded to the Lord. And as he was um, just staying at night with nothing doing, apparently, wondering where the next step will be, because the Lord had told them not to go into some areas, Asia and Bithynia. While he was meditating and thinking on what next step to take, he saw a vision in the night. God directs us in very many ways. Now, you may not be directed as God directed Paul. You may not be led as God led Peter. You may not be led as God led James or John. But God leads his own people. And the important thing for you to notice is that since you are born again, God must have his way of talking to you, his way of leading you in accordance to the word of God. And if you look back in your own life and examine your own life, you will see the hand of the Lord in your life as a child of God. Now, meditate on those ways in which the Lord has been leading you so that when he leads you, you will know that he is leading you. We have the promise of the Lord in the Bible that if we will look up to him, he will lead us in areas of our lives. Let's see some of the references pointing to that fact. In Romans chapter 8, verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. When we talk of the Spirit, there are three types of spirits. There is um, the evil spirit, there is the human spirit, there is the Holy Spirit. Now, when the Holy Spirit is leading you, he never leads you astray. But if it's the evil spirit, satanic spirit leading, he always wants to destroy, to kill, he wants to lead astray, he wants to deceive. And you must be very sensitive that you do not yield to the evil spirit. Now, you may be a child of God, you say, can evil spirit talk to a child of God? You know, Jesus Christ, while he was looking up to the Lord, while he was fasting, Satan came to tempt him. Satan came to lead him. Satan came to show him how to uh, establish his ministry and said, why not turn this uh, stone into bread if you are the son of God? But Jesus recognized that that was coming from the deceiver, from the tempter. From, the, from Satan, from the devil, and he said, it is written. If the leading of um, a spirit which you say you are getting is not in accordance with the word of God, then that is not the Holy Spirit. You know, at times, your own spirit, your own mind can direct you. But if your mind is not influenced by the mind of Christ, if your spirit is not controlled by the Holy Spirit, the leading of your own spirit will lead you astray. That's why it's important for us to understand that as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Recognize the leading of the Spirit of God in your life. He never leads astray. In Psalm 25, verse 9, The meek will he guide in judgment, the meek will he teach his way. Uh, there is a condition of heart we need to put ourselves before the Lord will lead us. If we put ourselves in the hand of God as flexible, meek, gentle, expecting the leading of the Lord and wanting to follow the leading of the Lord, then the Lord will lead us. But if we're not meek, if we're stubborn, if we make up our own minds, I will say this is what I'm going to do and I'm never going to do any other thing. You see, if you are not in a condition of meekness and flexibility, it will be difficult for the Lord to lead you. It will mean that you have made up your mind, you know what to do. And you do not need the guidance of God, the leading of God. And in that state of mind, it will be difficult for the Lord to lead. 
it's, it's easy for him to lead us straightforward for him to lead us when we're meek when we're gentle when we're willing to follow him it may be in marriage it may be in life's occupation it may be in the establishment of a business it may be on a very important decision you want to take in your family or in your personal life if you are flexible in the hand of the Lord meek, soft and gentle say no Lord I do not know the way I want you to guide me and I will do whatever you want, to, what you want me to do and I know if it seems difficult I know that your grace will carry me through in that condition the Lord will lead in Isaiah chapter 30 verse 21 Isaiah chapter 30 verse 21 let's read from verse 20 and though the Lord give you the bread of, uh, of adversity and the water of affliction yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner anymore but thine eyes shall see thy teachers and thine ears shall hear a word behind thee saying this is the way walk ye in it when ye turn to the right hand and when ye turn to the left the Lord is saying here that if we'll have respect for the teaching of the Word of God, and we'll have admiration for the teachers of sound doctrine, and we're not deliberately um, withdrawing from those the Lord has sent to teach us the truths, the gospel of the kingdom. And if, uh, as the Lord is giving us the teachers to teach us under anointing, will embrace the opportunity of, of um, receiving the teaching of those teachers then he says our ears will hear a word behind us saying this is the way walk ye in it when there is a tendency or a temptation to go to the right hand or to go to the left hand the Lord has promised us that in difficult times in difficult cases when we need to take decisions and we do not want to go astray, we want to succeed, we want to have the goal that God has set before us achieved. He promises he will lead. In Luke chapter 12, from verse 11, And when they bring you unto the synagogues and unto the magistrates and powers, take ye no thought how or what ye shall answer or what ye shall say. The Lord here is telling us that he recognizes that as disciples as children of God we will come into different situations at different times in our lives in the normal course of ministration in the normal course of carrying out the work of God committed into our hands in the normal course of carrying out the program mapped out by God in our lives maybe spiritual maybe secular maybe personal maybe something that is um, related to the church maybe something related to even government work or related to your own family enterprise now when you are brought to these people if you are not making up your mind i'm going to tell a lie i'm going to defend myself i am going to misconstrue the facts and the information if you are not making up your mind i'm going to be dubious and deceitful if you are just saying lord i know that you are holy god and as I'm going to this place, I want you to lead me. I want you to guide me. I do not want to say anything that is false, anything that will give a wrong impression, anything that will make you unhappy, that will make you to forsake me. I just want you to lead me and to guide me and to be with me in this situation. And it says, you take no thought what you will say, how you will answer. You, don't, you do not premeditate pre how you will cover up yourself, how you will defend yourself, how you will say something that is false and deceitful. And you are just open, normal, natural, saying, God, I just depend upon you. And as I'm depending upon you, nothing will come out of my mouth, my mouth except the truth. He says in verse 12, For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what ye shall say. Or what he ought to say in all these passages we're seeing that the Lord has promised that he will guide us by his spirit in John chapter 16 John chapter 16 a meeting verse 13 how be it when he the spirit of truth is come he will guide you into all truth for he shall not speak of himself but whatsoever he shall hear that shall he speak and 
he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. Here we're given the promise that the Lord will guide, the Lord will lead. And if we believe that promise, it will be fulfilled in our lives in Jesus' name. Let's see a case in the life of Peter, the apostle. Acts chapter 10, verses 19 and 20. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise, therefore, and get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. In our church here, we have always stressed that we need the guidance of the Lord. And we have always stressed it in particular in marriage. We have stressed the guidance of the Lord in marriage because we recognize the fact that we children of God were ignorant of the future, but God knows the end from the beginning. We know that we children of God, if God leaves us alone just for a moment to take a decision on our own lives, we will make serious, grievous mistakes. And we know that our God is a perfect God. When he makes a choice, he makes a perfect choice. And because of that, we have always emphasized it to brothers and sisters who have not yet got married that influences will come from the flesh, influences will come from friends, influences will come from relatives, influences will come from uh, different directions, but that these um, influences and the advisors, they do not know the future. They're ignorant about the future, like we are ignorant of the future, and that we ought to look up to the Lord every time, every time. And if we're looking up to the Lord, he has promised that he will guide us. And I believe that if we still look up to him, we're meek, we're not stubborn and rebellious, we're not saying I will never marry from that side, we're not saying this is the standard I want, this is the type of person I want, we just say, well, God, you are a perfect God, and you will make a choice for us. I believe he will make a good choice for us in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, in marriage, many times, we're tempted to be impatient. We're tempted to yield to our feelings. We're tempted to feel that I must just have it now, and I must just choose by myself. And sometimes we think we know how to choose. We, we think we know the right person. We know the, uh, the right one to pick up. But the Lord is telling us that he knows what he's thinking about us. He loves us. And if we leave that thing in his hand, he'll make a choice for us. And we will never regret the choice he makes. Because God never makes a mistake. God never makes a mistake. If human beings choose for you, they can make mistakes, terrible mistakes that can ruin your life, that can give you tears and sorrow all through your life. But when God makes the choice for you, he will never make a mistake. Now let's come back to Acts chapter 16. Paul was successful in the thing that the Lord told him to do in his life. We must ask the question why. It's because he followed the Spirit's leading. Not only in this case in which we're reading, but every time. And because he worked hard, very diligent. As you look at the life of Paul the Apostle, you will see that there were these great qualities in his life. He followed the Spirit's leading. He manifested hard work and diligence in his life. And also he had spiritual gifts in ministration. He, he depended so much on the Spirit. He had the fruit of the Spirit and the gift of the Spirit. Then whenever he was called upon to preach, he had a clear presentation of the message. And then also he had love and vision. Love and vision. I was telling you yesterday that love has a great part to play in success and achievement. And if you'll just follow these things that were discovered in the life of Paul the Apostle, following the, the Spirit's leading, hard work, diligence, the spiritual power of the Spirit of God in your life, a clear, distinct um, presentation of whatever the Lord wants you to do, and love, you'll find out that you'll be successful in your life. I told you that next Sunday we're having a special message on success and achievement through love. And um, I told you yesterday that 
I count it very, very important because many people do not understand how love contributes to success in life, how love contributes to progress in career or business. But I'm trusting God. And I want you to pray along with me that as you come next Sunday, by the grace of God in his own way, you are going to discover the hidden truth of victory, the secret of long life, the power for old age. I'm trusting God there will be a revelation on conquering the enemies of progress through law, that great weapon, securing the help of your strongest opposers, climbing the back of your greatest enemies to get to the highest post of position. I told you that there are people that always get whatever they want out of life, and I've told you that they have a common secret, and that common secret is law, which I want you to come on Sunday to discover and to receive, and receive that spiritual dynamics for successful achievement. It is life that is in Paul's life. He had this great thing working for him. That's why he was successful. There was this great love, which we'll hear more about next Sunday. Now we've seen that he depended on the leading of the Holy Spirit. As he depended upon the leading of the Holy Spirit, let's see how the Lord led him in um, Chapter 16, verse 9. Acts chapter 16, verse 9. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. Now, Paul was not a rigid person. When the Lord, by the Spirit of God, restricted him not to go into Asia and not to go into Bithynia, it was not through a vision of the night. It was in another way. And yet, at this time, he received a vision. He didn't say, no, I will never believe a dream. He didn't say, I will never take a vision in the night. He knew that God was speaking to him. A man of Macedonia appeared and just said a single sentence come over into Macedonia and help us. He didn't have the name of the person. He didn't know the town in Macedonia because Macedonia was like a colony, like a province. He didn't know in which direction he will go, but he knew that there was a job to do in Macedonia. And the Spirit of God did not give him the full interpretation in details. Just one sentence. Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately, let's stop there. How many times the Lord may be guiding you on marriage, and you say, God, I think you are talking to me, but I won't do it now. You know that type of attitude? You know, there are times the Lord is guiding you and um, leading you on, tapping you, spurring you on, saying, this is what to do at this time. And you'll say, God, I think I know what you're saying, but speak again. But you know, Paul the Apostle, he responded immediately after he had seen the vision. Immediately, we endeavored, we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering, believing that the Lord has called us for to preach the gospel unto them. You only have peace when you believe the leading of the Lord. You see, when the Lord is leading, you need to answer and respond with a measure of faith. If there is no faith, if there is no confidence in God, if you are saying, well, I don't know whether that is God or not, it will not be clear to you. You will seem confused. Your life will seem pull, pulled apart. But because they believe, they said, we gathered assuredly. We had this inner weakness, inner assurance, inner confirmation that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel unto them. Therefore, loosing from Troas, that means sailing off from Troas, we came to with a straight course to Samothracia and the next day to Neapolis. Uh, immediately they came out, there was a boat waiting for them. We can say this, that when the will of the Lord is leading you a particular way, there will be a boat to carry you to that place the Lord is leading you. But you know, if you say the Lord is leading you to do something, and the Lord does not make a boat available, the Lord does not make all the things available that the Lord, you, you say the Lord is leading you to do, then think about it again. 
You say the Lord is leading you to a particular sister, and the Lord does not make um, you know the chance, the boat to get through to that sister. Think about it again. You say that the Lord has been speaking to you about a particular brother. You know that is the will of God, and uh, there is no boat. The circumstances don't work out straight, and you wait and wait and wait, and um, instead other people are telling you, why not, brother, pray again because. This way you are talking, there is no boat to take you there. And you say it's the Lord. Oh yes, I know it's the Lord. If it's the Lord, the Lord will arrange the circumstances to fulfill his will. Or in the area of business, you say the Lord is leading you to do something. Well, if the Lord is leading, he will give a boat that will lead that way. And then you will see that uh, they just went from place to place, from place to place, until they came to the place where these women were gathering. There was no storm to hinder them, to slow down the journey, because the Lord was leading. You see, after we have said we have heard the voice of the Lord, the circumstances too can help us to know the confirmation of the leading of the Lord. And in verse 12, and from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia and a colony. And we were in that city abiding certain days. Now, when they got to that city, they abode certain days because now they had gone into the colony, into the province of Macedonia. And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made. They found that information and they knew where people gathered for prayer and were sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. That leads us to our second point, devout Lydia said. There were women that gathered together and um, Paul at this time saw that this was an opportunity here we need to understand something about the leading of the Lord. If you go back to verse 9, a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. If you didn't understand the leading of the Lord, you will interpret that to mean that when you get into Macedonia, there will be a man that will arrange a crusade. And that man will might be as tall as the one you saw in the dream, in the revelation. That man may be wearing exactly the clothes you saw in that revelation. Sometimes it is so, sometimes it is not so. That's why we study the Bible. Now they got into Macedonia, and when they got into this place, on a Sabbath day, they saw women meeting together. Now, Timothy or Silas or Luke or any of the people in the team might, might have told uh, Paul, saying, let's leave this place. This is not what God showed us. Let's leave this place. This is uh, not because there's no man among them. And you told us that the night vision you saw, you saw a man telling you, come over into Macedonia and help us. But there was harmony, unity, love, and submission among the team. They submitted. It's, God, it's Paul that received the vision. And now when they came to the assembly of these women, they didn't talk. They kept quiet. And Paul stayed on because Paul would be in a better position to know the interpretation, the significance of the revelation that he saw. No, none of them argued. You know, some of us might argue and uh, we might say, well, I don't think this is the place the Lord is leading us. In fact, some of us can even pull out, can even say we're not following the Lord anymore. We should study the Bible. Study the Bible. In the revelations that you say God is giving you, in marriage, in Christian work, in Christian activities, in the areas that God wants you to make progress in your life, God gives you a revelation. Let him assist you. Let him help you. Let him influence you in interpreting the things he has given you. And so they met uh, these women that resorted together. Verse 14. And a certain woman named Lydia, 
a seller of purple of the city of Tatira, which worshipped God, heard us. Among the women that gathered together, there was a woman that particularly responded. Her heart was opened to the preaching of the gospel. She attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And then she was baptized. And her household as well. She besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. Now, this is written about a woman. And we need to say at this time that the Bible is full of records of notable women who received the grace of God and manifested forth the grace and the glory of God. In the Bible, we read of so many women touched by God, used by God, Miriam, Deborah, Ruth, Anna, Esther, Mary Magdalene, Mary of Bethany, the one that poured the precious ointment on the Lord Jesus Christ, that woman in John chapter 4, the unnamed woman, soul winner, Martha, Dorcas, Lydia that we're reading about today, and of course, Mary as well. As you look at all these women, there is something that strikes you. All of them, no exception. You will see that all these women were women that were meek, submissive, very soft, and very teachable. Because the nature that God has put in women, if you react against that nature as a woman, you spoil your chance, you destroy your chance of being used by God. You must not contradict the way the Lord has, you know, said things. That you know that as a woman, saved, you are a real child of God. If, in fact, I would recommend that you study women in the Bible. If you are feeling that God wants to use you as a woman in the church, in society, and the Lord wants to do spectacular things through you, I will advise you that you study people, lives of people like Miriam, like Deborah, like Ruth, like Anna like um, Esther, like um, Sarah in the Old Testament, like Mary Magdalene, all these women that you never see them rebellious, hard-hearted, stubborn, difficult, but they submitted in the church, they submitted in the fellowship in which they were. Now let's just read some of the references in the New Testament pointing to women that the Holy Spirit gave enough recognition to bring their stories into the Bible. We see the love of God for these women. In Luke chapter 7, this is a woman that wept, cried, was sober and serious, repentant because of her sins. And this is what Jesus Christ had to say to her in um, Luke chapter 7 from verse 48. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. Thy sins are forgiven. Verse 50. And he said unto the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. You see, if you are going to be used of God as a woman, you must have this uh, repentant attitude. If you have never been saved, the place to start is to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. As a woman, of course, you know men also to repent, but we're pointing out uh, things concerning women in particular now. Now, as a woman, you ought to repent. Yield your life to the Lord. The first thing you ought to repent of in your life is pride, arrogance, worldliness. You know, just be so sure of yourself that you can do anything at any time, anywhere. Overconfidence, you must repent of that as a woman. You must take a low position, a subdued position, a repentant position. And uh, think about your life and see that the Lord wants you to be soft and gentle and meek and mild, repentant. And uh, you might uh, even have to weep tears of repentance as you look at your life, so dirty. And as you, as you repent, as you look up to the Lord, the Lord himself will say, Your sins that are many, they are forgiven. In um, John chapter 8, from verse 1 to verse 11, there was another woman here, a terrible sinner. That's not to say that only women are terrible sinners. 
meant you can be very terrible, more terrible. But we're making a point here. This woman was a terrible sinner. And she was caught in adultery. Brought to Jesus Christ. But you know, as she was brought to Jesus Christ and the Pharisees were saying, she ought to die. She didn't defend herself. She didn't say, no, it was the man that pulled me into it, giving excuses. You know, my sister, my brother, and uh, you are not born again yet. If God is going to pick up that woman, if God is going to transform and change that woman and make that woman an instrument of honor in his hand, there is something that must never be in your mouth as a woman used to be used of God. Excuse making. Never. You see, all these women in the Bible, whenever God used them, look at the traits in their lives. They never made excuses. And when they were talking of, uh, you know, stoning her and killing her and destroying her, she just stayed there, subdued, repentant, gentle, soft, quiet. And then Jesus said, as no man condemned you. And the woman didn't say, no, they too, they are greater sinners. They were convicted by the word you said. When you said, he that has no sin, let him cast a stone at me. They couldn't condemn me. I am free. No. She said, no, man, Lord. And you see that? The submission. You see, as a woman, if God is going to use you to build up your family, if God is going to use you to build up the church, if God is going to use you to build up any part of society, there must be that submission. There must be that quietness. There must be that lack of uh, stubbornness in your life. And uh, you are not defending yourself and making excuses. And Jesus said in verse 11, Neither do I condemn you. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Let's come back to Luke chapter 8 from verse 1 and it came to pass afterward that he went throughout every city and village preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God and the twelve were with him and certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities Mary called Magdalene of whom out of whom went seven devils and Joanna the wife of Chooser, Herod Steward, and Susanna, and many others, which ministered unto him of their substance. Now here we are told of the record of the women. They were saved, and they started being useful, ministering to the needs of Jesus Christ. But you know what we, what we learn about them? They were not ashamed. In fact, as the Bible is making the record that this Mary Magdalene in particular, out of her, Jesus cast out seven demons, seven devils. She wasn't because of that hiding in a room, hiding in a house, saying, well, everybody will be looking at me that I had evil spirit before. You know what Mary Magdalene did? She forgot the past and faced the future. She forgot association with evil spirits after all. Jesus has had mercy upon her and Jesus has cast out the evil spirits. She just forgot the past and faced the future. You know what hinders women from being useful to God? They have retentive memory more than men. They always remember things of the past. They always remember if they had evil spirits in the past, they always remember it even after they had been delivered. If they had sicknesses or some shameful things in the past, they always remember they have sharp, pretentive memory. And because of the memory of the evil things in their lives in the past, even though those things have been taken away, because of that, they are never able to rise up and be useful to the Lord. You see, all these women that Jesus Christ ministered to and healed and saved and became useful, they had this quality that they forgot the past. Woman, if God is going to use you, you must forget the past. Ah, all the problems I had in the past. My husband persecuted me. My children did not obey me in the past. People disrespected me. I had a sickness. I was taken to the hospital. Nobody visited me. And uh, when my husband had a problem with me, nobody sympathized. Forget the past. All these women that God used, they forgot that they had evil spirits. They forgot their terrible sicknesses. They were not ashamed. As long as you are keeping the memory of the past, the shame will be there. The shame will be bogging you down, hindering you, and tying you down. But they forgot the past and they ministered unto the Lord Jesus Christ. 
in Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Reading from verse 38. Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister has let me to serve alone? Be that therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Here the Lord was commending Mary, because Mary sat at Jesus' feet. Mary gave attention to the word of God. Now that is not referring to just reading the Bible on your own in isolation just taking the bible and saying well i know the spirit of god will talk to me in fact my sister let me tell you this as you study all the people that god used in the bible and as you study the women in particular think about miriam you have moses and aaron covering her ministry not miriam in isolation not miriam saying i too can pray i too can you know follow the lord the moment miriam began to separate herself with aaron saying is it only moses that god is speaking to we too can have this she had a problem but as a prophetess in israel all the time she was ministering and the ministry was acceptable to god you have moses and aaron covering her ministry i want you to think of deborah there was uh, deborah and there was barak I had decided going along with her even though she was the judge in Israel at that time I want you to think of Esther as Esther was ministering to the Lord there was Mordecai at the same time very near unto her now as you come to the New Testament as well you will see that these women they were not ministering in isolation the Lord has so made it that when he gives a woman a ministry he also brings up a man that knows much more generally he brings up a man that is able to support a man that is able to lead a man that is able to guide a man that is able to cover the ministry of that individual but you know you find out there are some ladies not in this church but outside and i'm not opposing anyone i'm not criticizing anyone. this is just bible teaching they, they single themselves out and they say well they are this or they are that or they are that but my sister understand study the bible study the women in the bible the women that were used of god in his own way they had men that covered the ministry supported that ministry not just men following after them but men who could guide them who could teach them who could instruct them men who could lead them in various ways now let's look at acts chapter 1 Acts chapter 1 verse 14 these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brethren let me ask you my sister suppose you are Mary think about it and you had had the visitation of an angel before you, you had your child the angel had spoken to you great great words powerful words concerning the child you are going to bring into the world let me ask you suppose you were married and you lived with jesus christ all through those days longer than peter lived with him longer than any of the disciples lived with him and you saw him in prayer you saw him in all his you know revelation knowledge and everything suppose you were married and then at the cross you were there at the cross and you saw him being nailed to the cross you saw him dying you saw him just resigning himself to the father and suppose you knew about that resurrection that your own child jesus christ he rose from the dead and uh, you know how many times the lord must have spoken to the mother after the resurrection and that mother will be so grateful that what the angel told he, her about mary that about jesus that those things were so now jesus has ascended into heaven has gone into heaven and then he left the commandment gather in jerusalem 
until ye be endued with power from on high. Would you meet as, a, as Mary, as a woman, so privileged of God? Will you meet with the congregation of 120 believers? Wouldn't you feel that you can understand the Bible on your own? You have the Spirit of God already on your own. Because before the birth of Jesus Christ, Mary had the Spirit of God overshadowing, overpowering her. And yet we read here, this all continued in prayer with one accord with the women many of them in particular then we are told even mary the mother of jesus without any pride without any position seeking without any type of uh, attitude wanting to be bossy over the people she just remained as part of that congregation waiting for the greater power of the holy ghost to come my sister, if God is going to use you as a woman to have a ministry, there must be this repentance in your life. If you are still a sinner, if you are already born again, there must be submission in your life. Then you must not have the attitude of, you know, self-confidence, of defending yourself, of trying to justify yourself. There must be this subdued attitude of being in the church, allowing the pastor of the church to guide you, allowing the zonal leader to guide you, allowing that the authority in the church that God has placed in the church will guide you and lead you. And uh, whatever, of the, whatever measure of the Holy Spirit you have got, you're still able to be humble enough to remain with children of God in the congregation of the righteous. These are women that God used. And I'm believing that God will use our women more and more in Jesus' name. Amen. In our passage, we have read of the conversion of Lydia. We have seen her willingness to serve God and to minister to the needs of these missionaries. We also immediately were saved. Now this is directed to both men and women. We must have a strong desire to minister to the needs of people, people in the church, people in the world, through the church, through the ministry of the church. Now the last part of the passage in Acts, Acts chapter 16, verses 16 to 18. And it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of diminution met us, which brought her masters much gain by suit saying, the same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God which show unto us the way of salvation. Let's stop there. The devil is very clever. But thank God, people of God are also clever. Paul and the team had been going in town. And every time they would leave where they were living and then go to the place uh, of prayer. So Paul will go and preach to the people gathered there. And I was a lady. A damsel possessed of devils, a spirit of divination, a soothsayer, a fortune teller. People knew her in that city that um, she was in a false religion. And she was following after Paul and the team, saying, These are the men of God, the servants of the Most High God. They are showing unto us the way of salvation. And the devil was trying to do two things. One, either to make the people believe that Paul and the team and this woman, they are saying the same thing. If they are saying the same thing after Paul and the team had left, she can do the follow-up and bewitch them. Well, the so saying, the fortune telling, the spirit of divination. All the people will say, uh-uh. If this uh, woman is supporting this team, and this woman is of the devil, and this woman is of fortune telling, these people too, they are bad. We are not going to receive the gospel. The devil wanted to do that thing in those two different ways. But let's learn here. Um, looking forward to another time, we'll be able to teach on how to use the power of God in our lives. How to minister. How to respond to the promptings of the Spirit. There was a team, Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke, as I've told you. Each of them had the power of God. Silas had the power of God. And Timothy had the power of God. The same thing with Luke. 
but Paul was the leader of that team. As this lady was following after them, Timothy did not say anything. Silas did not say anything. And Paul kept quiet. There is leadership in the work of the Lord. You know, sometimes some things might be happening. And you know that this thing should not be like this. We should do something about this. Don't let us start argument. Let us wait for the leading of the Spirit through the leader. And uh, they didn't talk. And uh, Paul also didn't talk. What's happening to Paul? Is he wasting so he can fast? No. Is he, wasting, is he uh, waiting so that uh, he'll be able to have the power to cast out the devil? The power was there, but he didn't do it. And the Bible says in verse 18, This did she. Two days. Verse 18. Is it only for two days the woman did that? For three days? What does the Bible say? Many days. Many days. And Paul kept quiet. Well, why did he keep quiet? Number one, because everything under heaven has time. There is a time to move. There is a time to be quiet. As she was following them like that and making us all over the town, these are the servants of the Most High God who show unto us the way of salvation. The devil thought that he was having a good time because once Paul and the team, once they go out of the town, then the woman can continue in a false doctrine and a false religion. But the Spirit of God allowed her to gather the crowd every day all the people that knew her they were coming because she was publicizing these are the men of god these are the servants of the most high god they are showing unto us the way of salvation everybody was telling one another first day second day third day the publicity was so much until the crowd gathered after the whole crowd gathered then paul turned back and said you evil spirit come out in jesus name and the evil spirit went out and all the crowd saw the power of God above the power of the devil the devil was trying to be clever but thank God for the Holy Ghost that's why in the church we are submissive to authority and to leadership even though we know a situation is there but by the grace of God there's leadership in the church and at the appropriate time the result will be greater than if we had hurried up and we had done something feverishly uh, at the beginning. Look at verse 18. This did she many days, but Paul being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out the same hour. I pray that all these things we have learned today will be beneficial to us in our Christian lives. And every one of us will grow spiritually and be useful to people around us by the power of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's rise up and pray. As a woman, submit yourself to the Lord. As any trait that you know is not good, which will hinder the Lord from using you, confess those sins and repent of them. And be truly converted, be truly liberated. As a man as well, talk to the Lord. Forget the past. Look forward to the future. Let the Lord use you. Your talents, your gifts, your knowledge, everything you have to his own glory. He will use you if you surrender to him. He will, if you will surrender to Him. Let's remove all pride, all rebellion and stubbornness. Let's be submissive and cooperative with the leadership in the church. God loves you and He wants to use you. Woman, study about women in the Bible and see the qualities of women that were used of God. Don't just study only one woman, study about the women, not just one, not just two, and see those qualities in their lives. 
pray that those qualities will be in your life and God will use you.